And hello, folks. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Michael Bryant. This is the afternoon session with you till about oh, 5 o'clock when the Daily Debrief rolls on with Aaron Keller. Today, we're getting a chance to look at some of the cases that I'm uh, calling uh, caregivers gone wild. Um, things just not working out so well for those put in that very important trust position. This case, you might recall, out of Ohio, the case against Lindsay Parton. Lindsay, this sweet, innocent-looking young woman, uh, was the babysitter for Hannah Weshey, a three-year-old. While she's babysitting this little girl, um, something bad happened, according to the prosecution. Uh, and, and within a short time of this little girl being dropped off the morning she was to babysit, the defendant was to babysit, dad dropped her off, um, she was on the phone to 911. Uh, and and the, 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 the little girl died soon afterwards. So the charge against her was endangering a child, involuntary manslaughter, and felony murder. The verdict, here it is. So once you hear the guilty to the felony murder allegations, everything else kind of kind of falls by the wayside uh, because obviously the, the the big enchilada there is the felony murder based on the abuse. With me now, Joseph Tully from uh, California, criminal defense attorney, and also Joseph Scott Morgan, our forensic death investigator. Uh, let me start with you, Joseph. This was a tough case because the causation was a little fuzzy. You know, the father had dropped the little girl off, and then uh, she passed out. And 911 is called. She goes to the hospital. She dies 10 days later. So it makes it very tricky, don't you think? Uh, yeah, it does, Michael. And I remember when we were specifically in the midst of covering this trial, it was it was multi-layered uh, going back uh, in time. And if I remember correctly, they were trying to put this off on the actions of the father at that particular time. But, of course, as it turned out, uh, this child had sustained... Uh, multiple uh, blunt force trauma and uh, led to this long kind of languishing lingering death uh, there in the healthcare facility in which he eventually passed away in. Yeah, the father, uh, he was a little sketchy to me. Let me ask you, Joseph, uh, if you're the defense and you can point at somebody like the father, that's always a good thing. How far can you go with that? You know, what do you really need to make that stick? Well, what you need is reasonable doubt in the eyes of the jury. And here, you know, the, the defense attorney thought or put out there that, hey, there's another party that could have the liability here. Is it unreasonable to assume or to find that the father had some hand in this or was responsible for it? Again, it was a short time. You know, do the facts match up with that theory? You know, critical to this case, as is true with any of these cases where there's an emergency, emergency situation, is the 911 call. This comes from Lindsay Parton, again, just moments really after the uh, dad had dropped off this little girl. So listen to her tone, what she says, how she says it. This is the 911 call. So, Joseph, let me start with you. What's your take on that call? What do you get from that? Well, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the things that turned out was that this child had a essentially a slow bleed uh, that had precipitated this over a period of time. And that was one of the big questions, um, you know, that could she still be upright and functioning after the initial uh, initial uh, blunt force trauma? And it, there were several instances of this. If I remember correctly, there, were, uh, there was a head strike. There was also an alleged dropping, this sort of thing. Uh, and I think that this lady is genuinely showing surprise and concern because the child begins to kind of drift off, and which you see many times with these slow bleeds, these these intracranial bleeds that you have uh, on on people in general, and not just children, you might not have an awareness of it in the beginning, but then lethargy begins to set in. Child's been moving, been moved around by her father in the morning to get her to this caretaker, and then suddenly, once she's arrived, uh, she begins to kind of drift off. Yeah, and, and to my other Joseph, sorry guys, I know you're both Joseph. Sorry, it's all Joseph all the time today. All good people are named <laughs> Joseph. There you go. Joseph Tully, uh, there was, there was a, an odd bit of information that when the dad was bringing the little girl, Hannah, to the babysitter, Miss Parton, uh, she was sleepy and wanted to, wanted to lay in her dad's lap or while he was driving. It was just a weird scenario that might lead you to believe something was wrong before he dropped her off. So with that in mind, uh, how do you read that 911 call? Well, compare that call to the, the Rosenbaum case here. If somebody is guilty, they're calling the police right away. They're calling the father right away. She's showing genuine concern, genuine you know, panic on the phone with 911. So if somebody is, is guilty, 
the common thinking is that they're going to want to cover that crime up, not expose themselves. So uh, that 911 call sounded very genuine to me, and like she was trying to be helpful and give details. Like she took a fall yesterday, you know, that that sort of thing. So it, that that 911 call could could very uh, very much support a defense. Yeah, and I think as this case ebbed. Back and forth. There really was the sense that, well, maybe she didn't, maybe she did. It was really, really unclear until toward the end. One of the folks providing some insight was one of the caretakers that, that had the child uh, at a time other than when she was with Ms. Parton. I think we have that for you now. Okay, so that was the radiologist showing us some of the images of uh, Hannah Weshi's uh, brain and the impact as she saw it that would have caused that injury. And I heard you, uh, Joseph Scott Morgan, you know, kind of agreeing to some of the things she said. If we can see that image again. I mean, I could look at it as a, an untrained person and still see it looks like something's wrong with the one on the right. It looks like some dark areas. Is that, am I seeing the right stuff? Help me uh, figure out what we're looking at here. Uh, yeah, there was a, a large, what we refer to as focal area of hemorrhage in that one slice that we saw uh, from, you know, the the imagery that they've done here. And let me kind of, for our, for our viewers and our fans, let me kind of break this down, what she's talking about. We have what's referred to as epidural, which epi means on top of, and then subdural, which means below. And for those that don't know necessarily uh, any of your neuroanatomy, uh, the brain essentially floats uh, in a sack, if you will, and there's literally cerebral spinal fluid that kind of washes the brain inside of that sack. Well, the sack itself is the dura, and uh, contained within that is the brain, and it's kind of like a shock absorber. It, 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 you know, it absorbs all the bouncing around that our heads do from time to time. When you get tremendous force, uh, what's going on within the brain, we can sustain what are called coup and contra coup injuries. That means the skull moves independent of the brain that's kind of free floating. You can get the brain that inside the sack itself will slam against one skull, one side of the skull, and then slam back. This will render a subdural hematoma. And that means the, the blood actually originates from within the brain, bleeds out, and creates pressure between the sac, the, epi, the epidura, or the dura, and, and, and the, the brain surface itself. And essentially what you have is the brain uh, uh, congest to the point that uh, if they can uh, interdict, they can drill a hole in the skull and alleviate some of the pressure. They'll put, you'll see these kids lots of times, and adults too, that'll have uh, intracranial monitors uh, that monitor the, the pressure inside the brain. In her case, the injuries, Michael, were just too overwhelming. They were, it was, it was too big for this little child to overcome. And I think a lot of this has to do with kind of the, the ongoing trauma that she had sustained, the strikes, the falls, all of these other things. And of course, this just goes further to kind of convolute the waters here. Oh yeah, I mean, that's a fascinating description of all of that because you know Joseph Scott Morgan, what I know is if I'm at home in the kitchen and I lift up quickly and hit my head on the counter, it hurts like hell. That's, that's yeah, what yeah. I know about brains. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break. Uh, I'm gonna get Joseph Tully's take on some of this other information in this case against Lindsey Parton. When we come right back, we're gonna hear from Dad. I think he's a little sketchy.